Welcome back. Uh, this is Professor Young, and we are starting part three of three, looking at the skeletal system. Um, so far, we have talked about um, overall function and purpose of the skeletal system. We've looked at some gross anatomy uh, of the skeletal system and some of the external structures and, and regions and things like that. Uh, in lab, you've learned specific names of bones. Uh, you've learned some specific structures associated with those bones. And now to wrap everything up with the skeletal system, uh, we need to look at growth and repair. Um, you know, how do we uh, grow new bones? Um, and, and what steps are involved in that process? And so that's, that's what we're looking at here during uh, this, this last session on... Uh, the skeletal system, and actually, it's not even the, the last of the last. Um, it's just the last of the series because we still have to look at joints, uh, and joints are involving the skeletal system as well. <clears throat> so, lots going on with the bone. Um, so, with that said, uh, why don't we go ahead and get ourselves started on growth and repair? Um, the first thing that I, I need you or want you to understand and appreciate is that. Uh, when we talk about the formation of bone, uh, we are really talking about a process known as osteogenesis. Um, and again, if we go back to our meanings of words, like we do so often, right, genesis here is uh, the beginning or the formation of and osteo simply meaning bone. And so this is the beginning of bone or the formation of bone or the development of bone. And so osteogenesis is that process of forming new bone. Now, <clears throat> before we get ahead of ourselves all too quickly, one of the things that we do need to uh, look at is, and, and I will do this repeatedly um, throughout this series of courses, because to me, if we want to understand what is happening within our bodies today, we need to go back to the beginning. We can learn a lot about why our body behaves the way it does today if we can understand embryologically how everything relates. Um, and so we're going to go back to that point of um, embryological development. Uh, within the embryo, uh, bone doesn't really truly exist. Um, we're not calcifying amorphous ground substance uh, within the mother, um, at least not during the first and second trimester. There's some of that stuff that does begin to take form uh, late second trimester into the third trimester. But uh, embryo and, and, and fetal bone is really made up of hyaline cartilage. Uh, and as that fetus matures and as it becomes more and more into that third trimester, that hyaline cartilage is replaced with bone. Um, and, and that process of replacing the cartilage with bone is referred to as endochondrial ossification. So endochondrial, within the cartilage, we have ossification. Endo meaning within, chondrial, chondrial meaning uh, cartilage, ossification, that process of hardening the amorphous ground substance. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, within fetal development, that act of replacing hyaline cartilage with bone is known as endochondrial ossification. And you need to understand that this is a process that does not start with spongy bone. It does not start with the, uh, with the um, uh, epiphysius, which is different than what happens in juveniles and adolescents. Because during the growth period with juveniles and adolescents, growth and lengthening of the bone does occur within the epiphyseal plate and comes down and lengthens the diaphysis. Not the case with fetal development. And, and primarily because you're not really engaging in lengthening of the bone with fetal development. What you're really engaging in is ossification that transformation of hyaline into bone. Uh, and so therefore, within fetuses, 
Uh, this is a process that starts with the diaphysis and moves and, and gradually um, moves up and down into the epiphysis. When we discuss flat, now this is in long bones. Endochondrial ossification is a process, and, and let me stress that because I don't want anyone to say, well, you didn't say that. Um, endo, endochondrial ossification is a process that occurs. If I can type. With, oh my gosh, within the long bones. And, and I stress that because we, we've come across this other term, intramembranous ossification, which is the transformation of cartilage into bone, but it happens within flat bones. And so the process of turning cartilage into bone within the cranial bones, within the scapula, within the sternum and the ribs and the hip, uh, that is a process known as intramembranous ossification. And, and what ends up happening is um, it, it takes that connective tissue, it takes that cartilage, um, and it first turns it into spongy bone. It's unprotected spongy bone. And then later later, late tri uh, third trimester, uh, middle to late third, tri uh, third trimester, what ends up happening is the external and the internal plate, which is compact bone, does go ahead and take form. But for the most part, for the most part, those flat bones is just specifically the dipole, uh, the, the, uh, dipole uh, and that's all that is there. It's that spongy bone that's left on... Uh, unprotected. So, um, and, and the other thing I'll back up and, I'll, and I will say as well is this, this process of endochondral ossification, just remembered about this, um, does take place starting in and around the sixth week. It does start there. It's very slow. It doesn't really ramp up uh, until at the middle of the second trimester um, and then going into the third trimester, it really, really amps up. Um, but this is a process that does slowly begin within the sixth um, week of development. And if you think about it, if you think about it, continues through a person's 20s, early 20s, 20, 21, 22, definitely it finishes up. Um, and so this is a very slow-moving process throughout one's life. Um, ultimately, ultimately, endochondral ossification and intramembranous ossification uh, really culminates with the ossification of the epiphyseal plate, uh, aka the growth plates that we talked about during the last Wimba session. And so what does this all look like? Well, here's an x-ray of a fetus. Um, and this here would be a fetus that would be in the uh, early to middle third trimester. Um, and what you're looking at here is uh, where all of the red is. Um, that there is basically cartilage being turned into bone. Um, the clear areas are definitely um, specifically all cartilage. All right, and you can see, I mean, if you look at the cranial bones, you can see that it looks very trabecular. It looks like spongy bone. Uh, those diplos are, are there, but the external and internal plates have not totally developed as of yet. Um, and, and if you compare the spongy bone or the trabecular bone that's found within the, uh, the cranial bones to that of, if you look at the humerus or the ulna or the radius or the femur, you can definitely see the difference. You can see that compact bone-like appearance within those long bones, uh, and you just don't have that within the cranial bones. Even if you if you check out the scapula real closely uh, and the pelvic bone real closely, you can see that it is still very much trabecular bone, um, where where that spongy bone uh, or the um, compact bone just has not completely uh, formed yet. <clears throat> and so that's that's what it all looks like embryological. Now, I can't stress enough um, that when we talk about growth within juveniles and adolescents, that growth 
and uh, we've been here, done this, occurs along that epiphyseal plate. Uh, there is a line of cartilage, and, and that's another key aspect for you to keep in mind, that we are definitely talking about uh, cartilage making up that epiphyseal plate. Within that area, we have four distinct regions. We have the zone of reserve cartilage, the zone of proliferating cartilage, the zone of hypertrophic cartilage, and then the zone of calcified matrix. And again, this kind of uh, spreads from uh, the diaphysis, uh, where the zone of reserve cartilage is, down into uh, the shaft of the bone, which is where your zone of calcified matrix uh, would be more closely um, located. And so what we need to do is spend a few minutes just kind of looking at each of these zones uh, and what is happening during each of these zones, uh, and then from there move into uh, how does all of this exactly equal length, and how do we balance length with diameter, uh, which is where we will end everything up uh, at the end of this session. And so why don't we go ahead and we'll jump into each of these um, four zones, and we'll look at exactly what happens as we move from uh, a cartilage-based epiphyseal plate into the ossification of bone within the shaft. First, and this might take a couple minutes because I want to do some, uh, some drawing here for you guys. We're going to take a region of bone right, right here. And what you need to understand is that this area right here uh, is going to equal the... epiphyseal plate, and the area down here is going to equal um, ossified bone, and remember growth is happening along that plane uh, and in that direction, right, and so that's kind of where we are, so that uh, on the far right is the epiphyseal plate, the far left is definitely the ossified bone, and what we need to understand is what is happening uh, on the in-between. Uh, and so, right here in this area, we have uh, an area that is referred to as the zone of reserve cartilage, and it's that zone of reserve cartilage uh, that uh, where new bone cells start out not as osteocytes, but as chondrocytes. So we have that chondrocyte base, uh, which is primarily hyaline cartilage, that is starting this whole area. And again, this is referred to as the zone of reserve cartilage. Think of this as the base layer that is going to produce all of the bone later on down the road. Uh, the other thing it does is it takes that epiphyseal plate, which again is this hyaline cartilage, uh, and it anchors it to the epiphysis, which is composed of fungi bone. So that's the other thing that you need to kind of keep track here. So <clears throat> right here is the zone of reserve cartilage, and as we move forward, we, are, we need to look at the zone of hyperplastic cartilage, right? And with the zone of hyperplastic cartilage, I'm going to go ahead and recreate uh, what it is that we were just looking at. Uh, with the zone of hyperplastic cartilage, hyper here means accelerated. Hyper means accelerated. Uh, plastic does not mean the stuff that uh, toys are made out of and that kind of good stuff. Uh, it's actually a variation on the word plasia, and plasia here means growth. And so remember, we talked about that term metaplasia, which referred to cell growth. And so here is that zone of um, 
reserve cartilage. Uh, and what ends up happening here is uh, those chondrocytes that are coming out of that zone of reserve cartilage begin to divide quickly. This is an area where cell division is in high gear. All right? And so the number of chondrocytes are dividing at a very increased rate. And so we can go ahead and put in a bunch of supposed mit myotically, mitotically dividing chondrocytes. There, right there, right there. Pop in a few more just so you can get the idea. All right. And again, we are moving in a right to left direction. <laughs> and so now we're moving away from uh, the epiphysius. Um, or, or that um, area of spongy bone, and we're moving down towards the uh, the compact bone. All right, and so this is the zone of hyperplastic. Hyper here meaning to increase or, or rapidly increase. Plastic here is a play on the word plasia, uh, which means cell division. Now, as we continue down, uh, and again, i got to redraw everything here. I apologize. But as we continue down, we then enter into the zone of hypertrophic. Hyper again means trophic. Uh, hyper again means uh, increase. Trophic here uh, means um, levels. Uh, these, are, these are increased levels. What we see here is mitosis stops. Cell division stops. But we see an increase in cell size. And so here, once again, we've got, oops, that's no good. And so here we've got that um, zone of reserve cartilage. And then here uh, we have hyperplastic cartilage, or that zone of increasingly um, meiotic activity. So we're adding to the number of chondrocytes. Right. And then we begin to proceed into this zone of hypertrophic cartilage, right, where, again, we're not increasing the number of cells. We're increasing the size of the cells that are already current. So the chondrocytes are gaining volume. They're gaining mass. Now, I also want to stress once again that this is a process that is moving right to left. Okay? We're moving right to left. <clears throat> then what we do is we enter into that final zone of zone of calcified matrix. This is where this is where the chondrocytes go through this process of apoptosis of programmed cell death and what was once the chondrocyte um, now begins to absorb in calcium salts and those calcium salts harden the amorphous ground substance that was once associated with the chondrocyte, and it forms a very weak, uh, inferior version of bone. 
Uh, and the reason why it's so weak and inferior is because it was once a, it was once a, a chondrocyte. It wasn't even of the bone lineage, so it doesn't have the strength or anything like that that was once needed. Uh, and so what ends up happening is because it's an inferior, weaker version of that bone, um, as soon as that bone is calcified, osteoclastamin, which is a which is a macrophage lineage, it is not an osteoprogenitor lineage. And so that osteoclast can come in and immediately, be, within the next uh, day or so, begins to reabsorb uh, that hardened bone matrix, uh, forming the pit of reabsorption, releasing the calcium, allowing it to be reabsorbed again. And that breakdown of that bone increases blood calcium levels, which is detected by the, uh, by the thyroid, which is going to release calcitonin, which is then going to trigger... Uh, the production of osteoblasts and then officially replaces that chondrocyte with legitimate uh, uh, osteoprogenitor lineage uh, material or, or bone. And so that zone of calcified matrix, what we end up seeing is we end up seeing a complete switchover from uh, what was once a, ca a um, cartilage-based material or tissue to one that is now strictly uh, bone. And again, it involves the hardening or the calcification of what was once that chondrocyte, the breaking down of that calcified chondrocyte matrix by osteoclast, and then uh, due to the increased level of blood calcium levels, um, the triggering of the release of calcitonin to allow uh, differentiation in the creation of an osteoblast to go ahead and call os calls ossification or solidification uh, within that bone. And here's another view of what we are uh, looking at and talking about. All right, and so you can see uh, this area right here. Right there, that would be the um, zone of... Um, uh, hyperplastic cartilage, I'm sorry, that is not, that is the zone of reserve cartilage right in there. This right here would be the epiphysius right there. Here we have that zone of reserve cartilage. And then right in here, we have the zone of hyperplastic cartilage. And right here, we have the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. And then lastly, we've got the zone of calcified matrix right in there, and so you can see those four very distinct zones uh, and what they look like um, if we were looking at this from a histological perspective. Now, how exactly does bone, or how does, exactly does this equal lengthening, and how do we know when to stop uh, lengthening? Well, here's what it comes down to. This whole process of lengthening the bone, um, to some extent, also expands beyond the simple monitoring of blood calcium levels. Um, because otherwise, uh, we wouldn't grow, uh, you know, all, all the monitoring of blood calcium levels do is uh, maintains the bone that is currently there. If you're looking to add to the length of that bone and, and or density of that bone, uh, some other key players need to be able to uh, respond, and that's what we see happening. Uh, human growth hormone, uh, which is found within the uh, anterior pituitary, um, is released. Uh, we have the thyroid hormone. Um, again, uh, calcitonin primarily, but, but you have some other uh, thyroid hormones that are going to be involved with that. And you also have sex hormones. Um, both males and females do contain androgens, such as testosterone. 
and that is exactly the main hormone that is involved in the growth of the bones. Um, because males have higher levels of androgens than what females do, uh, it tends to lead to males being taller and females being shorter because there's just not enough level of testosterone or androgen within the body uh, to have the females become tall. Now, with that said, it also depends on genetics as well. What is that height potential? Uh, what is the average height of members of your family? Um, do you have tallness that runs into the family? You know, there are definitely females that are taller than me. Uh, I, I'm on the well, I'm on the average side, but I consider myself short. Um, I'm, I'm like five eight, five nine. I'm, I'm right there in that average height for um, males. Um, but there are definitely females that are taller than me. Does that mean they have a higher level of testosterone than I do? I, I hope not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that kind of tongue-in-cheek. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that they had a higher height potential starting out than what I did. And so, therefore, under the right circumstances, they're going to reach that height potential. Uh, and I reach my height potential as well. But it doesn't mean that they had more androgens present than what I did. Um, so so don't, don't read into that and, and misinterpret that information. Typically, in and around the start of puberty, and, and puberty in, in girls can start as young as eight or nine years old. In guys, it's still happening a little bit later, um, in and around ages of anywhere between 10 and 12, typically, for, for boys. Um, but what happens is those sex hormone levels increase dramatically. Uh, and the more those sex hormones are released, the more the thyroid hormones are released, and we also see an increase in the release of human growth hormone. Um, what we see happening is um, almost like a um, – I can't think of the words that I'm looking for um, – a, a surreal or an unrealistic um, fast-forwarding of activity that takes place within that epiphyseal plate. And so that those chondrocytes are just constantly being cranked out and bone is constantly being produced and that lengthening ends up happening um, over a relatively short period of time until the point where it just burns itself out. And there's, there's, this, there's, there's nothing left that those chondrocytes can possibly put out. And at that point in time, that epiphyseal plate, which is hyaline cartilage base, ossifies and solidifies itself, um, replacing it with a bony joint for the, for, for the most part. Um, and so the hormones have a direct stimulant uh, response, stimulus response uh, on that epiphyseal plate that speeds up the growth. It can speed the process up to such an extent where you literally, people have been able to uh, suffer through, if you would, um, growing pain. And, and what a growing pain is, is the um, fast lengthening of the bone and the tendons and the ligaments don't have time to stretch and keep up with the rate of growth. And so you've got a pulling on those ligaments and tendons that are painful because not only are you now pulling on ligaments and tendons, but if it's a tendon, you're pulling on the muscle that's attached to it. If it's a ligament, now you're pulling on other bones as well, um, all while trying to to keep up with the pace of lengthening that's happening within the bones. And that's what's referred to as growing pain. Uh, it's very common. It's very common. Um, and, so, and so that's kind of where we are uh, with uh, this whole process. Um, now, I will also say that, um, you know, beyond the adolescent and, and, and young adult growing years uh, where uh, bone is lengthening, Bone needs to be remodeled throughout life, and it's going to follow those um, uh, that process of um, osteoblast activity, osteocyte activity, and then having the osteoclast come in and breaking down that bone. And, and that is all regulated through a, uh, uh, if you would, a law, quote-unquote, known as Wolf's Law. Um, and Wolf's Law states that the rate of bone remodeling, the rate – I 
of bone remodeling is equal to the stress and um, force applied to the bone. Right? So people that are very athletic um, apply much more stress and force onto their bones, and so their bones tend to be remodeled uh, more frequently than someone who maybe is a couch potato, um, and those bones are not used as frequently. The downside is this. Uh, people that tend to be um, on, the, on the overweight side or obese side, because they lack the physical activity, their osteoblast activity tends to be decreased and their osteoclast activity tends to be increased. And so they actually have a wide a thinning of the diameter of the um, uh, compact bone and they have a widening of the medulla, uh, medullary cavity because the bone gets thinner. Whereas the reverse can be true of those that are very athletic. Because they are athletic, uh, osteoblast activity tends to outpace osteoclast activity, uh, and therefore they tend to have a thicker um, area of compact bone, which decreases the diameter of the medullary canal. Uh, and so, in fact, people that are more athletic and more fit tend to have a higher bone density than those that are not as actively um, uh, fit. Uh, and so kind of keep that all in mind. And again, that's referred to as Wolf's Law. Um, and that kind of regulates and oversees this whole process of, well, when are we remodeling and when are we not? On average, the, the average person um, sees a complete restoration and remodeling of the skeletal system about every seven to nine years. If you're athletic, it's going to be every five to seven years. If you're a little bit more on the couch potato side, uh, it's going to be every eight to ten years, nine to nine to ten years, something like that. Um, but there is that range where, typically, about every seven to nine years, you're over that over that seven to nine year span, your complete skeletal system uh, has been um, redeveloped um, and and uh, rebuilt, uh, so to speak. And so uh, with that. Um, Hopefully, you now have a much better understanding of what is happening inside of your skeletal system. Um, and I will leave you to your studying. As always, if you have any questions, please, 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 excuse me, uh, feel free to shoot me an email uh, and ask away if there's questions. Uh, until then, have fun studying, and I'll see you in lecture.